God. The setup for this film and where the idea came from actually has no resemblance to what the eventual ending of the movie was. So we wanted to do a thriller. Um, we had one idea, but the research took us into the computer world, um, which was very fledgling at the time. And uh, and we realized it's a great place to put a character in the midst of you know destroying somebody somebody's identity. What interested us about the story, in addition to the computer virus stuff, which was all really kind of secondary, was just the nature of identity and how easy it would be, you know, in modern society for one to kind of lose a handle on on who they are if they're predisposed to that sort of thing. You could really take this one element and make a whole movie out of it of somebody who's just not themselves. And it accorded really well with the stories which were beginning to pop up in the press and the specialty press of the time and computers about how everything that you do is being watched. That every single movement you make is seen by somebody and most of the time, nobody really cares enough to bother to put the information together or mess with you. But if they did, wouldn't that be scary? I would say the big difference between what wound up on the screen and what we had written on the page initially was that when Erwin Winkler approached us, we were told specifically that they wanted a movie with a tone of something like... Uh, Three Days of the Condor or The Parallax View, one of those very dark, paranoid 70s thrillers, and Irwin produced it, at least one of those two movies, I think, Condor. Um, and we said, great, because I love those movies, I love, and, and nobody makes them anymore. There's this hidden world of information handlers, negotiators, dealers that's just obscure. And we like the idea of seeing, could we pull off a thriller with a villain that never had a face? You know, maybe would have individual hitmen here and there but that finally you couldn't say, oh, he's the bad guy. It's just this whole thing has a lurking, hidden monster. So both of our takes were significantly darker, significantly more ambiguous as to, you know, what was going on, who was the bad guy, and is there really anything you can do about it? Um, I recognize why decisions were made not to do that. Audiences won't go for a villain that they can't root against. You know, in the very basic formulae of good guys, bad guys, and you can't have a bad guy that's sort of bad in some ways, but finally does a nice turn, and that that was all too ambiguous. And then we have to keep it black and white. And the grays just confuse the experience for an audience. We really wanted to humanize the villain, and we wanted to be able to bring it down to the level of the character that Sandra Bullock plays. So we came upon this character of this charming British uh, a love interest initially at the beginning of the film uh, who really ends up becoming the predator for her and really turns the tables on her. Is that business or pleasure? Is there a difference? Not a great deal if you're a hacker. And also key to that too was for her character. We wanted to make her faults, the things that got her into trouble, be the way that she had set up her life and because she had never really tried to open up herself to any kind of love interest and through this one sort of mistake of meeting this guy on a beach and letting him win her over and the way he wins her over is is because he's researched her and knows all of her problems knows all of her uh, uh, foibles knows all of her flaws and vulnerabilities he goes after that and that makes her vulnerable it isn't really a human connection it's something that's been falsified so she ends up almost getting killed as a result of it Shit. my purse it's not worth getting killed. Come back! So it was key to us to make that a human connection, not to have some kind of uh, unrealistic uh, villain coming after her. It's not here. We always wanted it to be a woman who was the lead. Uh, we feel like uh, they're, they can be much more empathetic and also much more vulnerable and have bigger obstacles to overcome. Um, and we also really wanted to paint a character that was extremely isolated, uh, almost in taking 1984 uh, to the nth degree, where this character uh, has, has been able to find a way to exist, which is literally within the four walls of her house, by being able to order food over the internet, by having her communication with supposed friends over the internet, people that she would have never met. Um, she can get all of her communication uh, over the internet or through a FedEx package that is controlled by the internet. So at the end of the day, we wanted to have a character that had found what she thought was a very comfortable life and a way to exist that meant that she never had to really communicate or connect with humans. And then the trick was take that character 
and take away all those safety guards that she had, everything that she thought she could rely on. What? What, what happened? Angela Dale's dead. His plane crashed last night outside L.A. He, I, I just talked to him yesterday. He was, he was coming to see me. The ability to be able to stay in her home, that gets taken away from her. The ability to communicate with people over the internet, that gets taken away from her. And really strip down her identity to not all the, the trappings of credit cards and everything else, but just to who she is as a person. And make her examine that throughout the film in a thrower way. So every time she's put to a test, it makes her realize that she actually has a lot more fortitude than she thought she did. Yeah, we've got uh, Ruth Marks trying to run a scam in a house. Wanted for prostitution and narcotics, so we're gonna bring her in. Um, would you excuse me? Um, I'm gonna be right back. I'm just gonna use. I had remembered that I saw Sandra Bullock in a picture that she had done with Sylvester Stallone. She shined for me, and I kept saying, Who is that girl? Who is that girl? I was really intrigued with her. And at the time, she had done a couple of movies, Speed was the most notable. She's extremely charming in the film. Uh, both Erwin and I felt she was very winning. Um, weren't sure that the studio would go with her because she was a newcomer. And, uh, but we said that we would take a meeting with her. So Sandy came in into our offices here. And oddly enough, it was a day that Erwin has a fish tank in his office. And the minute that Sandra walks into the, into the uh, office and she's wearing these overalls and just look really kind of cuddly and fun, uh, one of our fish started to cannibalize one of the other fish in the tank and it all of a sudden caused this whole kind of thing that we just the three of us were connecting over what is going on in this tank and sandy was immediately so winning to us and so much fun and uh and we both just had we all all three of us just had a great time we spent a couple of hours together talking about the film and and literally as she walked out the, the door and turned to me and said that's somebody that we can spend two hours in a movie with i'll tell you after spending um a while with her, I said, boy, I'm madly in love with this girl, you know. I came over to my wife, I think I found somebody I'm madly in love with. So she completely charmed us. Um, surprisingly enough, she didn't jump to do the part. She said there were a couple of things in the script that she didn't like uh, and wanted us to work on it before she commit. So here was an actress who was just starting out, offered the starring part in a, in a, in a kind of, not a, a, you know, important movie. Um, and yet was willing to turn it down because she didn't like certain aspects of the script. So we did the work and, and then it was a joy from then on. The interesting thing about Sandra is, is that when you see her on the screen, probably one of the real few actors that's like this, what she is on the screen, her charm, her openness, her sense of humor, her self-deprecating sense of humor, is really what Sandy is in real life. Computers your life, aren't they? Yes, perfect hiding place. So we obviously now had to start to work on the Devlin character. We read 50, 60 people. There was a lot of people who wanted to do the role. Um, all a lot of good names, really terrific actors. Um, and we saw everybody imaginable that we could that came in to, to read for it. And literally in the, one of the last days when we were weeks away from, from shooting, Jeremy Northam came in and he read extremely charming British actor, uh, Royal Shakespeare trained, uh, won an award for replacing Daniel Day-Lewis playing Hamlet. Uh, the studio said, well, what do you want, an Englishman and all that? And I wanted very much to have somebody that had an international flavor, that uh, this conspiracy that was going on was beyond just the American uh, borders. Not only had we found the best actor, but we found somebody who the audiences didn't know, and so their expectations weren't set up so that when, when Jeremy meets Sandra on the beach, you don't know where it's gonna go. He's not somebody you've seen be a bad guy in a movie before. He's not somebody you've seen be a good guy in a movie before. You just immediately are attracted to this guy. How long would it take to track her? Depending how much she's set up, how long she stays on. 15 minutes, half hour the most. Will you call me the second you find her? And that other matter, Mr. Devlin? Oh, that's, um... That's free of charge. Dennis Miller uh, came in to see me. Um, again, I'm very open about seeing actors, and uh, Dennis came in, and I, I just was knocked out by him. He's funny. Uh, I felt that the film needed a little relief uh, at some point, and I thought he would be able to give it to us with, with 
with still being a tragic character who, who dies very quickly um, and leaves a mark. Well, come on, I'm not a cab. Say hi. Hi. Can we go now? Yeah, now we can go. When an actor's given Leary one scene to establish himself in the movie, it has to be pretty definitive. And what Dennis was able to do was immediately charm the audience so that when two scenes later he's killed, you feel terrible about it because you liked him so much and you really wanted to see it work between him and Sander because he is funny, he does seem to care for her, and he does seem to be a real human being. I am going to take that as a big, big compliment. Guess what time it is? Gibson's. Almost. We have no onions, so we'll have to use these. Seldane, the antihistamine of champions. His rapport with Sandy, uh, you could see uh, at some point, which is great, there's a certain exasperation on her part, and I think it's part of the exasperation of she being an actress and him not, uh, where she doesn't quite know what's gonna come next, and, and, and I thought it worked great for the character where, and where she is at that particular point. Such a nightmare, it's like I'm not even me anymore. Hey, I think the trick with this film, I think with any film succeeding, is, is that if you buy into the characters and if you buy into who these people are. If you're not you, Tell me who you think you are. And the one great tribute about what Irwin does as a, as a director is, is that he focuses primarily on making those people real and uh, making them believable and getting great performances out of them. And that's really where, when we come onto the set every morning, he works with the DP uh, on what the shots are going to be and how he's going to tell the story visually. But then once that's done, he spends really the rest of the day on the characters and on the actor and what would they do as a real person, what's going to be believable. And when you look at the history of Rowan's movies as a producer, they've always been about character. They've always been about strong, interesting people. And that's what Rowan brought to this movie. Uh, a lot of other directors that we could have considered may have made this a really thrilling movie and a real fun, but I don't think it would have had the lasting quality to it that Irwin brought to it because you identify with these people and you want to watch these people and that's what Irwin worked very, very hard on. I like to put a kind of a, a, a subtext in, in the film that uh, rises into the pot as it's boiling over. To me, she was always the angel. Uh, to me, he was always the devil. Um, the, the gatekeepers and the Praetorian guards are all um, historical uh, uh, religious icons or, or um, legendary icons. Meet in IRL in private. The world of computers does have that feeling to it. It does have a kind of mythological feel to it and it does have a sort of religious feel to it as well because the world of the, the internet and, and uh, that's kind of out there in cyberspace is still something intangible. And I think people still do feel like there's some kind of odd god running it, and so we wanted to infuse that into the film. Strangely enough, the, the uh, Ned predicted uh, the, the place where we are now, and I don't think we've changed much beyond that. Uh, yeah, maybe we've become technically more proficient, but there hasn't been that many really, really substantial changes in our method of communication to what we predicted it would be. Uh, and we, we, did, we weren't soothsayers. We didn't predict it based on nothing. We had the information available to us, as everybody does. I don't understand. I don't understand. Why me? Why me? I am nobody. I am nothing. But they knew. They knew everything about me. They knew, they knew what I ate. They knew what I drank. They knew what movies that I watched. They knew, they knew, they knew what, where I was from. They knew what, what, what cigarettes I used to smoke. And, 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 and everything they, they did, they must have watched on the, on the internet. I don't know. Watched my credit cards. Our whole lives are on the computer. And they knew. They knew that I could be vanished. They knew that nobody would care. That nobody okay. would understand. And they knew okay. would. Hey, matter it's anymore. Going to be okay. People have said the movie is kind of prophetic in its own way that uh, uh, computer viruses and the whole idea of the internet being potentially a dangerous thing as well as a it was a wonderful tool was not really so out there then. <sighs> okay, what's this? Terminate all modes. Let's go to files now. Terminate. Oh, gotcha, don't I? I don't think we were pressing. I mean, we were definitely working from information that was out there. We didn't make up the idea of computer viruses, but it certainly was novel. Okay, let's 
Looking at this again, I was uh, uh, amazed at how much time is spent just watching Sandy Bullock type. Uh, she's, she's an incredibly dynamic typist, but uh, uh, I was actually surprised that they managed to, to sell that visually to the point where it really it didn't get boring to look at. or 30 percent of the movie is somebody typing at a computer looking at a computer screen and probably 70 percent of the movie is a character is the lead character being by herself and the first thing that everybody told us was they just loved it it was something they had never seen before in a film never to that extent or never was that kind of jazz to it and also that sandra was so uh, appealing to watch doing this so every time we did a cut of the film and put it in front of an audience we kept putting a little bit more and a little bit more in and we never really reached a threshold where people said, enough, we can't stand watching that, tele that, that computer screen anymore. I think we could have certainly gone a lot further into the dark realms of it, that people are generally so much more familiar with how scary their computers are, from, you know, cybernet stalking and, and you know, creepy individuals who just won't let you alone and mess with your life, to, you know, innocent-looking emails that destroy everything on your hard drive. It's a dangerous little world of connectivity, and it's, you know, we barely scratch the surface of that. Now that we're living in, in more or less a terrorist society, uh, who knows what people are capable of doing? We're finding out that people are capable of doing a lot. Uh, people are crossing the line a lot more. In reality, our threats aren't from a Russia or an organization somewhere or the mafia. It's from radical individuals that have no, not necessarily any kind of major ties to anybody that they can cause a great deal of damage on a whim. The biggest threat is going to come from some cyber geek somewhere in, you know, in the middle of nowhere with the computer and the, and, and the wherewithal to, to get in and launch a global virus. God damn it, you're in the mainframe. It's eating through Greg's entire system. Devlin, do something. Devlin, it's a virus eating through the gate people program. There's going to be nothing left. Everything will be destroyed. Uh, we wanted to show some kind of resolution at the end of the film uh, for the character and, re and make the audience realize that she had come a, a long ways. Uh, obviously, by the time she is... Uh, beaten the bad guys at the end of the movie is is that she certainly has saved herself and, and by happenstance saved the world but we really wanted to be able to show that as, as a character and as a human being that she has opened up her life so we had this metaphorical scene of the walls coming down of her planting flowers of her connecting with her mother and having her mother come and join her I can't remember what you told me to plant you know what why don't I come outside and help you? I'm trying to convey stories now, and that's maybe me, um, that are less to do with um, using devices by which we can communicate and trying to get people to touch each other a little bit more. And, and that's where I, my own personal feelings go. And we wanted to open up the scene at the end as we, the camera pulls up and away. But Irwin very particularly wanted to have a moment where he realizes that just because she's done this, it doesn't mean that there is still not an inherent problem out there, which is true. So we ended up with a little cursor at the bottom of the screen just to remind everybody. So that's just a warning uh, that don't think things are going to always be uh, nice and happy at the end because you never know what's going to come. Hey, it's Lisa here with some behind the scenes trivia. Now, the first recorded use of special effects as we know them was done in 1857 by Oscar Rieslander. He took 30 different photo negatives and combined them into a single image. This was the first example of the montage print. Now, if you haven't already done it, remember to click here below to subscribe or on the side for more great content.